Hey, Adventure Sports Podcast family, welcome to the show. This Life Outside the Box episode is brought to you by Camp Crate. If you are looking to get into backpacking, or even if you're already experienced but need some new ideas for where to go, Camp Crate rents gear, sells highly researched itineraries all over the country, as well as offers packages called experiences that include the gear, the itineraries, food, any associated costs with permits. Uh, It's like a fully planned, all-inclusive backpacking adventure sent right to your door in a box. And since backpacking season is coming to an end, one of their experiences would make a great gift for Christmas. So visit campcrate.net to learn more. Also, we are trying to grow this podcast, so over the fall and into the new year, we're going to be looking for uh, bigger guests and ultimately make it a more valuable experience for you. So if you would like to help support that, you can become a patron of the show at patreon.com slash adventuresportspodcast. It costs five bucks a month, and you get the satisfaction of knowing you are helping to make this show happen. Our goal is to have 50 patron supporters by the end of next month. So if you're thinking about it, get out there and do it. Lastly, if you have any comments on the show or you have some guests that you want to recommend but you don't want to send us an email, uh, give us a call. Our new number is 812-624-5763. That's also 812-MAIL-POD to leave us a voicemail about anything you want really so feel free to call us we're looking forward to hearing from you all right let's get to the episode today's guest has written one of my favorite books of all time it's called vagabonding an uncommon guide to the art of long-term world travel and uh, the author is rolf potts and so he literally wrote the book on long-term world travel and not just how to but more so why we feel the need to do this and very practical ways for you to get out the door and go live a life that surrounded by travel and coming home to community. That's also an incredibly important aspect of long-term travel that a lot of people don't really think about. But yeah, he dresses it all. He's a total professional and I highly recommend his work. So you can find it on Amazon, find it almost anywhere. It's a great book and has been read by thousands upon thousands of people to learn how to vagabond. So Rolf, welcome to the show. Glad to be talking to you. Yeah, man. I don't want to get too geeky, but uh, I read your book and was immediately inspired. It was given to me by my best friend in 2011, immediately inspired me to to ride a bicycle across uh, the country. And I totally fell in love. I read it, reread it, and read it again. And it was actually the first book I gave my wife when we first started dating. And uh, we re- reread it together. And uh, I just wanted to say this is this is a good this is cool for me. I'm really excited. So thanks for doing this. You bet. And actually, that's not the first time I've heard of like a sort of a vagabonding related romance. I've had other people who who've, who've shared the the book uh, on the road early on. So it's it's always fun to hear. Yeah, honestly, I, we still talk about it all the time, and she was really excited to hear that you're going to be on the show. So, awesome. yeah, um, tell me about, you know, a lot of people may have not heard of you, and I know you wrote this back in 2002, and you're probably tired of retelling the story, but can you talk to the listeners just about how you got started with writing and what encouraged you to write this book specifically? Yeah, well, actually, I, I don't believe it or not get tired of talking about it. It's, it's it remains a, a a core passion, um, and I you know I just love you know the 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 blessing of being able to talk about a, a book that has reached out to so many people. But it was sort of the culmination of a maybe a ten year process before then, when I was um, sort of a teenager and dreaming about travel, but think that, but I thought that I had, didn't really deserve travel. I, I didn't think that long-term travel was something I could do when I was young, unless I was rich or some sort of hippie dropout with all sorts of travel secrets. And, uh, so before the, the book ever came into my consciousness, when I was just finished with university in my early twenties, I worked as a landscaper for a year in Seattle, saved some money and traveled the U S 
for eight months uh, living in a 1985 Volkswagen van again. Uh, now this is like a hashtag, hashtag van life. But at the time, I had no frame of reference at all. I was just winging it. Um, and I was really, you know, I was just worried that I wouldn't get to, uh, the chance to travel later on in life. And so I was really setting out in this van when I was young to scratch the travel itch so that I wouldn't be bothered by the regret of not having traveled. But what happened when I traveled around the U.S., I didn't even need a passport at the time. It was just the U.S. and Canada. Um, I realized that it, that it was easier than I thought it would be, and it was safer than I thought it would be, and it was cheaper than I thought it would be. In fact, gas was under a dollar a gallon back then, and I, f I don't think I spent more than $5,000 in those eight months. So I was, I was living in North America. I ate a lot of ra ramen noodles, uh, and I slept in my van a lot, but I just had the best time. I, in, in many ways, I'll never have a trip like that because in addition to seeing this beautiful North American landscape, I was, I was, um, I was doing it for the first time. And, and so, uh, I think it was mixed in with a certain gratefulness that, uh, you know, you can only appreciate for the first time ever. That first experience for you obviously led to more and it led to a book. How, how long did it take before you basically gathered the information you wanted to say, I, I, I need to share this. Well, that sort of took me by surprise. You know, I thought I'd, I've, I've been a writer since I was pretty young, uh, since I was sort of writing imitation Stephen King stories when I was 13 and writing for my school newspaper. After I finished that first vagabonding trip when I was 23, 24 years old, I tried to write a book about it. So my first attempts at travel writing weren't really advice related. They, they were I was trying to tell the story of this journey. Um and I just, I wasn't in a position where I, I could do that very well. I, I, I wrote a half or three quarters of a book. I sent it out to agents. Um, it sort of worked at the, at the sentence level, but I hadn't, I didn't really have my storytelling chops down yet. And it was, I've said since it is, it's been, it's better than graduate school, you know, that, that trying and failing to write a book that means a lot to you, um, is more important than any paid education I could have. And so it, it really taught me lessons that paid off down the line. What, what happened is, uh, you know, in terms of leading up to what happened with the book, I, I moved overseas because I had some friends that were teaching English in Korea uh, at the time. This is mid-90s, mid-late 90s. And um, they were making a lot of money. They were having this great uh, international experience overseas. And so that was the second key thing in this progression is that I had that, that those eight months of living in a van and traveling the United States and really just having the time of my life and learning so much. And then I moved to Korea ended up teaching there for two years, uh, and I was able to save tens of thousands of dollars. I lived very simply. I did a lot of uh, under-the-table tutoring, and I basically saved em enough money to travel for two more years, um, in addition to the two years I spent in Korea. And around this same time, I started writing for Salon.com, which at the time had a travel department. It was a much different iteration of the political of the political website it is now. Um, and so I just, I just started telling these travel stories and that really got my foot in the water of travel writing. But again, it wasn't travel advice. It was travel storytelling. And I, I did a story. I tried to sneak into a Leonardo DiCaprio movie called the beach and ended up with a, uh, you know, uh, a story for so long called storming the beach, which made it into the best American travel writing. And so I sort of was beginning to get my grounding as a travel writer. And I still hadn't really seen, um, my career in terms of advising other people about travel, except while I was writing for Salon, I got a lot of emails with two categories of questions. One is how do I become a travel writer? And I didn't really know. I only knew my own story. So I started interviewing other travel writers and I've been doing that for, for 18 years now. I've been interviewed a travel writer a month at, at rolfpost.com. Um, since before there was blogging, I was doing that kind of content. And then the other, the other question was, how do you, how do you travel for so long? You know, I've, I've, I've been on a vacation for two weeks, but that's all I can get. How, how it, you, you've been traveling for six months. You've been traveling for a year. How do you do this? And so the I, I put this advice up for free on my website. Um, it was a 10 point list. I didn't want to call it a manifesto cause I didn't want to tell people what to do. I called it a suggestifesto. Um, <laughs> I and, like that. And, <laughs> And instead of, uh, you know, this, the, the travel advice that may have been out there elsewhere, like this is how you roll your socks and this is the size of backpack you should get and this is where you should go. It felt like those bases had been covered. What, what wasn't being addressed was the why, was the philosophical existential reason for why you should go. So 
I dovetailed, there's a lot of, you know, Walt Whitman and Henry David Thoreau and other just life philosophy in my advice. It was life advice about taking it slow and, and doing it now and going out and meeting people. And through a weird set of circumstances, um, an editor at Random House found it and said, could this be a book? And it was really perfect timing because I was only thinking of travel storytelling when in fact I was in the perfect position to parlay all these years of experience of trial and error and failure and success into a deeply philosophical yet practical book of travel advice. And so when the editor emailed me, I said, sure. So I went back to Thailand. I rented a little uh, room in a residence hotel and spent the eight, the next eight months writing the book. So so right when all of this was was fresh, and in and these experiences were new, and I was still feeling very grateful and and sort of existentially um, excited about about being able to take advantage of my time wealth, which, as you know, is sort of a core of the vagabonding philosophy. It's it's the idea that we're all born equally rich in time, and and in a way, how we spend our time is more important than than the possessions we collect or how we spend our money. And it doesn't take that much money to actually give yourself a lot of time to in, enjoy your life. So, um, so I wrote the book and, um, gosh, that's been, it came out in 2003, which is 15 years ago. And, and it's still, I've written four books now, but it's still what people want to talk about that somehow that passion and gratefulness that I had at the time parlayed it into a, a book that, that people still like to talk about and still, um, you know, dovetails with their own excitement and gratefulness and, um, time wealth. I, yeah, I think that's, you know, and I don't mean to beat on the same drum as everyone else with bringing up that book again, but man, what it really opened up to me, I'm I'm from a small town in Florida. I didn't do a ton of traveling, really not much at all, other than a couple family vacations. And that book just made me realize just how doable it all was. And so I went for it, and just like you, just like you suggested in the book, I became a janitor at a school, worked until midnight every night just to save up six hundred dollars for my first two month trip um, that was traveling across the country, and then uh, another one right after, not right after, but the next summer that was six months, and totally by the book, following what you what you were talking about, and. And that's what I appreciated the most. It wasn't the nitty gritty of how to pack or, or exactly where to go, but the philosophy behind it, which obviously through all your quotes, um, all the suggestions you had of other writings just opened my world into tons of other writings that I eventually just delved right into on those trips. And so I, I think it's that, I don't know, that spirit of that book is incredible, man. So uh, thanks again for writing it. <laughs> you bet. Well, it's funny, you know, you aren't the only person who's written me and to say, Hey, I, you know, I met my wife on the road. We sort of mm -hmm. bonded over your book, but you might be the first person who's ever written to say, um, I clean toilets to fund my travels <laughs> because, oh, man. because I, so many toilets. I bring, up, I, I bring up this line in the book about from the Charlie Sheen movie, wall street, where he talks about making his, making a, a million dollars so he can ride his motorcycle across China. And I'm just, I say in the book, look, you you can you can spend a few months cleaning toilets and have enough money to ride your motorcycle across China. And people love to quote that line, but I think you might be the first person who's actually emailed to say, "Look, I literally cleaned toilets. I literally did what you suggested in that part of the book." Yeah, that's great. Man scrubbed and and janitor, mopped floors, thousands of square feet of floors every night. A gym, in fact, and uh, it paid for a six month trip. And I was full time student, and you know it was tough. It was challenging. You had to eat a lot of ramen noodles and a lot of canned tuna and if you're always lucky but now i wouldn't trade it for anything and those experiences are honestly the the, the the trophies of my life that i would hold up and there and there are there are billionaires who don't have six months who will die without having traveled for six months so it travel really is something you give yourself it's something you decide to do it's it's not tied to riches it's just tied to enough money to be able to do it so many of our listeners love, 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 love their, their adventure sport, whether it's, uh, you know, cycling or running or whatever. And so many of them can't necessarily justify the time now, what, you know, depending on what stage you are in life, they might have a family and kids and whatnot, and they want to be able to use that time to follow their passion, but justify it in a way to where it brings in at least enough money to cover the time. Does that make sense? Um, like it doesn't make a living but I can justify B 
being gone for a month because at least it covers the bills while I'm gone. So we're really trying to reach out to to folks who are uh, making these side hustles that are focused around a passion seem so possible. And uh, one of the really interesting decisions that I think you've made is, well, frankly, where you've chosen to live your life when you're home. Uh, a lot of people want the, the glamour of a big city or think that if they want to be full-time travelers, they have to live in a, a, an extravagant, exciting place. But you, you chose Kansas, man. What, what is, uh, what's up with that? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I'm from Kansas. I, I grew up in Wichita. And, and, and in some ways, vagabonding was sort of a, a, a letter to my 17-year-old self. You can appreciate this being from a, from a small town or a more provincial part of the country where sometimes you feel in, in these out-of-the-way places you, that you don't have permission to do this, that this is some more sophisticated task for someone from New York or Portland. Uh, and so I've, I've really tried to downplay the idea that this is some elite or insider counterculture activity. It's just something that you decide to do. And I think one of the lessons that travel taught me when I was overseas is that I could base myself in a super cheap part of the world and get by for next to nothing compared to a major American city or a, or a major world city for that matter. So I wrote vagabonding in a small town in Thailand. My rent was maybe $150 a month. I was paying a dollar a meal for some of the best Thai food I've had in my life. And I realized that um, even though my editors and a lot of my friends live in big hip cities like New York and San Francisco or even Austin and Portland, that I could really, I could go back to a place like Kansas where my family lived. Um, and one of the lessons I learned from travel is that people all over the world live close to their family. They pool their resources. So I, um, I'm back. I'm, I live next door to my parents who can keep an eye on my place when I'm gone and, and I'm gone a lot. Uh, and my sister and her family are nearby and I'm going to go see my nephew's cross country race, uh, in two days. Uh, and so it's, it, 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 I just realized how much happiness people find through family around the world. But then also, it just the, the cost of living, the overhead is so cheap in a place like Kansas. Um, it's just exponentially cheaper than um, than living in a bigger, hipper city. And the thing of it is, is I can still visit those cities. I probably spent I probably spent two months in New York this year. I don't always spend that much time in New York, but um, it's not like I'm completely walled off from the big city. I actually have a, a, a good social life uh, in in places like New York. Um, or Los Angeles, where I'm going later this month, but I don't, I don't have to subscribe to just sort of the ritual expenses of living in a place like that. You know, you can, you can go out and have a have a delightful but somewhat modest meal with a few drinks, and you're 150 dollars out. You know, uh, and that's a lot. Like I said, 150 dollars was was my rent when I was in Thailand. So I don't want to be a snob about this. I don't want to, to practice one downsmanship and say that everybody has to completely uh, live in, a, in an ultra cheap way. But this is just one of many strategies I've had to make my life pay off in time. You know, that I, 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 live, I live in rural north central Kansas. I, I don't live in Wichita where I grew up. I live about a mile and a half north. Um, but it's beautiful here. It's peaceful. Uh, I have 30 acres to, to relax and, and stretch out in. And then I, I have the flexibility. I have the time to do, to do interesting things, to winter in warm places, to, to spend time in New York or London or, or Southern Africa or Hawaii, as I did last winter. So again, it, it's just that idea. And again, like a lot of your listeners are going to have families and, and, and more, you know, stable jobs that keep them to one place. But I think just wrapping your head around the idea of finding strategies to create more free time in your life um, can be a part of the vagabonding mindset. Um, and even, you know, I, I think there's a lot of sporty people who listen to this podcast. You can you can save up for a mountain biking trip in the Andes or in Tasmania, and then once you get there, then the mountain bike is just something that opens a window to a thousand more things. And that's the great gift of travel is that it doesn't just have to be about the activities you do. It doesn't have to be about, you know, mountain biking, a, a, a mountain on a different continent or kayaking a river on a different continent, but it's all the amazing things that happen to you along the way, uh, that make travel so, me so memorable. Um, and so I, yeah, I have, I dedicate a chapter to adventure in vagabonding and I don't mean to disparage adventure, adventure sports, but I, I make the point that oftentimes those sports are a window into a much deeper adventure, which can be just confronting the unexpected in a, in, a, in a place that's not your own. If you want to get into backpacking, but you're not sure where to start, 
go check out campcrate.net. Campcrate can help you plan the backpacking trip of a lifetime and supply you with all the rental gear you need. Simply go online and choose your gear and your itinerary. Campcrate will then ship your gear anywhere in the U.S. When your trip is finished, use the pre-printed return label to ship the gear back. It's that easy. Campcrate. Rent. Explore. Return. Honestly, what we encourage here, it is not about the numbers, your stats. Your sport is basically your framework to to build a life around, to build the ability to learn the lessons about the more important things in life. If you're obsessed with the sport and only the sport, you know, something's wrong. I was just talking to a guy earlier today who uses, you know, he goes for races. He wants to do races in the mountains because that's the best way he can justify the time and money to get out there um, rather than just going to leisurely walk around and see it. And that's just his choice. And so it's the sport itself that gets him out there in the first place. And, uh, but he's, he's aware that it's not about that. It, it, you know, he, he's very thankful to be out there. Well, yeah, we live, we live indoor lives. We, we live so much time f- through our screens, be it the, our phones or our laptops. So that's an important first step, you know, regardless of, again, your, your times or your personal records or, or the other technical aspects of being outside and to appreciate outdoor sports. The most important part is, is, is the, is the outdoor part because it's simply something people don't do these days. And that's another thing, another gift of travel, just like it's an, a gift of outdoor sports is that it takes you out of those routines where you're looking back at your screen all the time. It throws you into uh, unpredictability where you, where you, you confront your isolation and, and your possible loneliness and your boredom and, and, and you get your bearings in a way it's just this deep human experience that we're sort of cheating ourselves out of because we live such mediated indoor lives these days. Yeah, absolutely. And to go back to your point before, uh, do you think that you could be who you are today and have accomplished the things you accomplished by living in an expensive city? Well, it's hard. It's hard to say, you know, I'd, I'd like to think, I, I like to think yes, but it would require such a bigger budget. You know, it would. I I have the luxury of in mid career of not really having to write anything that I don't want to write. You know, I don't have to. I don't have. I don't have to grind. I don't have to teach classes. I don't want to teach to make money. I don't have to write articles. I don't want to write or books that I don't want to write to make money. And that's a luxury that I have by way of geography. Uh, you know, I'm a fairly conservative. I, I've saved money and I have, I, I still have a travel nest egg. I, you know, I make more money than I did when I was in my twenties, but, um, yeah, I, I really think the difference is that I just have a, a, a richer palette of, <laughs> I guess, palette. It's a palette of funds to, to draw. on. I would love city life, but I would just have, I would be less time rich. I, I would have to, to dedicate more time to the grind in the city than to being outside. And again, I'm sure a lot of your listeners live in cities and, and they have their own way of navigating things. I actually did a, a podcast episode about uh, livable cities and the idea that you don't have to to live in the, not just the New Yorks or Los Angeleses, but you don't have to live in the Austins or, or Portlands or Minneapolis. You don't have to live in a cool city. And I'm not going to knock the cool cities because I've lived in those places myself, but there are small, um, smaller places that have really great things going on that are just more within your budget. They're, they're smaller, quieter American towns. And we forget sometimes that we don't have to keep up with the, it's not a rat race, but it's sort of the, you know, sort of a hipster keeping up with the Joneses of, of being in a cool city. There's a ton of cool cities. There's a ton, a ton of affordable uh, cities. Um, oftentimes they are maybe in the upper Midwest or the South or places that aren't ne- necessarily as fashionable as the, as the coastal cities, but, um, they're ways, they're ways of enabling things. So just, you know, for your listeners, there are strategies, lifestyle strategies that go from not having that Starbucks coffee and, and brewing and grinding your own to, living in a much cheaper, uh, city, um, that can enable that the kind of savings that, that creates time wealth. And again, going back to your own experiences, you, you were a janitor, you know, you, you did something that people dream about who have much more powerful jobs. So it's a really a matter of that self-discipline, that simplicity, that creating, um, opportunities to spend less money and enable the kind of travel that can change your life. Mm. No, that, that's fantastic, man. Um, I live in Denver right now. I've been here about four years and 
you know, it's one of those cool cities. And I will have to say, I tell my friends who live in the Midwest, who live in small towns, like, am I happier here? I'd have to say I'm not. Uh, hmm. You know, I have closer access to the mountains, which I love, and that's the reason we moved here. But the grind takes up so much of the time that I find myself not getting to those places as often as I did when I lived in Florida, which is 2,000 miles from these big mountains, you know? <laughs> so it's yeah. honestly... It's so relative, and so it, it's taught me a lot, and I've, I've revisited your book. Um, right now, I have to stay here for, for a, a business I've started with a friend, but I can totally, when I leave here at some point, it, it will be, I'm not, I won't be looking back saying, wow, you know, I'm really missing out because, man, it is so overrated in so many ways. Um, but if you can find that balance, that, that's that's where it lies, and I want to ask you, you know, after you experience all these things, I know you talk about it in your book and I've talked about it a lot with a lot of friends. When you come back to Kansas, is it difficult with the experiences, this crazy experiences that you have all over the world? And I know you spend um, time in Paris every year. Um, is it hard to connect with the locals or are you kind of past that as you get older? Connecting the locals in Kansas or, or elsewhere? Yeah, just connecting with people that might not understand just what kind of experience you just had. I, I knew that for me, I live in a small town. When I came back from my first bike trip, it was extremely hard for the first, and I was young, I was 20. It was extremely hard for me to connect with, with family again, just like you don't understand what I just saw. Like, I, I, you know, chased by bears and elk and, and saw the entire country, saw Alaska and just felt very disconnected when everyone wanted to talk about, you know, maybe what they did over the weekend. Yeah. Well, this is something I address in the last chapter of Vagabond, that sometimes the the weirdest challenge of a long-term journey is coming home. And you've, in a way, travel slows down time. You're having this density of experience. You're, you're experiencing new things every day. And at week's end, you think back to Monday and it's like, oh my God, that seemed like a month ago. I've just done so much. Um, and I'm not being snobby about this. This is just what happens when, when you leave home and you get out of your routines so that neurologically you experience time in a different way. What, what happens is you get home and then, you know, the people around you haven't had that experience. Um, and you don't want to be a jackass about it. You know, you don't want to, you know, try and sort of prove to them what you've done. Um, it, it's something that you can quietly appreciate. And of course, these days you can have a greater network of friends. Odds are you have a lot of friends left over from your travels. And those are the kind of people that you can reminisce with. And so uh, that, that's humbling, but it's good, you know, that you come back home and you get back into the rhythms and, and um, the, the kind of things that you experience back home. So I, I, I go to high school football games and barbecues and other things that reflect the pace of life in north central Kansas. Um, and I've been doing it for so long now that I'm not as rattled as I was before. But it's not about me being a missionary of my own life and, and preaching to the people around me, but just sort of doing as I was when I was, a, when I was a traveler, I guess, and just sort of listening and, and watching and, and, and taking part in activities that are nearby. Admittedly, when I'm in Kansas, I'm a little bit more of, of, a, of an isolated person. I like just sort of getting back and lifting weights in my barn and going for runs and, and, uh, reading some books. Uh, and so I'm not necessarily a social butterfly when I'm back here. Is it lonely? Um, you know, I'm, I'm the kind of person who, who's a, a little bit of a, of an introvert. So I don't really get lonely. It's, it can be solitary sometimes, but you know, my family's close by. And so, um, you know, I see, I see my nephews and my sister and her family and my parents quite a bit and then their extended friends. And so it, it, weirdly enough, it's not just like having a lonely outpost in on the prairie that I come back sort of with a built-in community. And I have friends that I grew up with in in Wichita, which is an hour and a half away. And in fact, I was just there this weekend visiting some of them. So it's not, it's not too difficult uh, of a transition. Um, and, and to follow on to one thought you had earlier, I love Colorado and I love the mountains there. But when I was doing my podcast episode about affordable places to live, Colorado, Colorado didn't really ping the radar very much. It's just not a, an, it's not a cheap place to live. California and, 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 and Oregon are the same way. But there, there are great mountains in, in, in Tennessee and West Virginia and North Carolina, which may not be as sexy as Colorado and Oregon and, and California. But I know that just as Asheville has become a fashionable place in North Carolina in the last 10 or 20 years, there are other places in Tennessee and in West Virginia um, 
you know, or Virginia or North Carolina that are an equivalent. And the mountains might not be as high as Colorado, but if you're looking for that lifestyle, that outdoor, that rivers and mountains lifestyle, there are other cheaper places to do it. So I just wanted to add that on that um, Colorado is a, is a place I love. I grew up going there from Kansas every year, but it just, it's just not as affordable as some other places that do have mountains and, and rivers and, and other places like that. You know, in, in the podcast episode we did, California and Oregon, two other places I love, didn't really show up much on the affordability list. But places like Tennessee, North Carolina, West Virginia, Virginia, uh, more southern places that have great mountains, great rivers, uh, and other good context for the kind of outdoor lifestyle that I'm sure your listeners enjoy uh, are more affordable. And, you know, some people, plenty of people can afford Colorado and, and, and California and Oregon in such a way that they can keep a lot of free time for travel. But again, feeding into this whole vagabonding mindset and, and really just being strategically about creating a life that has time for the kinds of things you love, be it travel or it be, be it outdoor sports and long weekends. Um, there are other strategies for um, settling yourself in a place that, that has outdoor options. I know Tennessee came up a lot. I don't have a lot of experience in the mountainous part of Tennessee, um, but that was just a place that was pinged a lot. You know, there, there's people who are out kayaking and, and, uh, and mountain biking in, in sort of the mountain south uh, in a way that's more affordable in, the, in sort of the more glamorous mountain west of the U.S. Hmm. I, yeah, I'll have to say, um, personally, I am, I am in love with the, the grandeur of the West and the, dr the drama of the West. It's mm. just so big and so vast. I don't think that can be replicated, but if, if it's the day-to-day -day things that you're looking for, um, just from experience, uh, it, it is very hard to get out there and it was hard. We came here with no plan. It was very hard for my wife and I to get on our feet um, even now just trying to start our own businesses and trying, you know, to do new things, uh, any hiccup in the process can really slow you down for a long time financially. And so huh. I, I think that that wiggle room that cheaper places offer is for the listeners that are, you know, maybe in a place that they don't necessarily want to live like, take it from Rolf. He lives in the middle of Kansas and you travel more than probably all of us put together. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think sometimes, too, we, we have a simplistic we, – we apply a more simplistic way of thinking to the United States than to other countries. You know, we, we, we're sort of – we try to embrace the complexity of, of faraway countries, but we see the United States as this electoral map of, of red states and blue states, and we assume that there's – certain places are, 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 are more – going to be more attuned to our way of being in the world, but it's a – it, it's a purple country and you can find your people in lots of places. You know, there's a time at which Asheville became the new Santa Fe uh, as far as being an, an, an outdoor community. Well, there's 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 three dozen new Ashevilles pop, popping up all over the place. It's just that they're not really humming on the radar yet. And so, again, I'm not I'm not telling anybody to, to, to leave to leave their hip American West places and and find a, a cheaper place. But it, it, it is an option. It's, it's one of those things in your toolkit. Um, and it's uh, and and again, I I literally have a sticky note on my wall wall that says American West Road Trip. In the next five years, I want to do another um, road trip that covers Colorado and Utah and Montana and Washington and Oregon and place. But again, those are that's based out of Kansas. That I'm going to be saving my money in Kansas so that I can spend four months driving through the American West and really enjoying it not as a weekend warrior type trip, but as a place where I'm once again. Uh, traveling and, and having adventures every day, all day, um, like I have enjoyed before. So again, it's just be, it's being strategic and really figuring out what you love to do and how you spend your time and, and making sure that you are making life choices that can pay off in, in free time to, in, to enjoy this sort of thing. Awesome. And so, uh, you, you pay for this mostly through writing, I would assume. Yeah, through through writing and through teaching and through public speaking. Uh, do do you think that the uh, maybe industry of travel writing is saturated at this point? Like like you obviously got in at a at a at a good time, I'd say compared to now. Is it is it maybe kind of hard to get into? <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's a different hustle. Um, I got in. I was at this cutting edge of like um, online travel writers during the dial up age of the internet. I was really seen as this person as sort of this when I was in my 20s when I was first 
getting my word out there as this this internet guy who's not necessarily submitting to the National Geographic or the Atlantic, but is writing for Salon and World Hum and is, and is writing these long form articles. Well, the bottom fell out of that anyway. It doesn't matter that I got my foot in the door. There's very little $2 a word travel writing out there left. Um, and a lot of it is not as interesting to me as, as some of the other stuff I've done. So uh, I, I'm, I'm lucky in that I've written some books that have done well. Um, and I have, you know, I've, I've been teaching a class in Paris for a long time and there's other opportunities where I can sort of diversify my income in, in, in tandem with living simply, uh, and saving my money. But these days it's, it, travel writing is more multimedia. It's more about establishing blogs and, and, um, sort of creating your own income source. Yeah. YouTube channels. I mean, there's so many ways to kind of, for people to experience what you're doing, um, do you feel those pressures or do you feel like what you're doing uh, is substantial for what you need? Well, what I'm doing is is substantial. Um, but, you know, I started a podcast a year ago. I haven't monetized it yet, but it's certainly a new media venture that brings me a lot of pleasure. Uh, and I've done I went around the world with no luggage nine years ago and I live blogged that and I actually shot three or four videos a week during that experience. And so I've been diversifying my toolkit. Um I'm not, I guess I, I've sort of been spared the hustle that comes with being an air quotes influencer, um, which is how people sort of monetize that lifestyle. Um, and I don't know if I can really speak to the task of breaking in to the travel writing trade in 2018, except to say that really focus on what you love, you know, don't really bend your skill set to what you think you're supposed to write about it. Find out, find out what you love and what you're passionate about. Because, you know, I, if I hadn't have written actually a, a couple things, if I, if I had written, if I had been successful at age 23, uh, instead of later on in my twenties, my, my writing chops wouldn't have been good enough. It was good for me to fail a few times before I finally got successful. And then too, by the time I wrote Vagabonding, I had lived it. I had been immersed in that world for years. And, you know, the root of author is authority. I had gained a lot of authority and passion and gratefulness uh, on the task of, of vagabonding. So I think for anybody who's thinking about writing for a living, and I, and I often say, don't, to enable travel, don't write, you know, find something else, deliver mail, wash toilets, um, start a business, become a graphic designer. Um, that, that that travel writing has an enabled travel, you know, that Actually, my, my early money was landscaping money and teaching money, and, and actually travel writing slows down my travel in a way because I have to stop and, and write about it. But if you do decide that travel writing is your thing, then find something you love so much that you'll become an expert on it and that your passion and your expertise will show. And that, more than marketing and, and, and you know micromanaged social media strategy, is what's going to attract your audience. By now, you certainly know who Bent Gate is. That's for a great reason. Bent Gate Mountaineering has been sponsoring the Adventure Sports Podcast almost from the beginning, and we really appreciate that. They've made it possible for all the great shows to continue coming your way. We want to say thanks by reminding you to go to them for your backcountry gear. If you live in Colorado, then just stop by their store in Golden. If not, go to bentgate.com. They have what you need from the latest ultralight gear to the tried and true classics for climbing, hiking, and camping like Arcteryx, Hilleberg, Nemo, Western Mountaineering, and many more. Need advice? They have you covered there too. Their staff are passionate adventurers who can offer help from their own experiences. Bentgate also hosts lots of events and speakers. Check out their website to see the schedule and to see all of their products. Help take care of the Adventure Sports Podcast by getting your gear from Bentgate Mountaineering. So have you, you know, you, you took some odd jobs early on. Have you taken odd jobs? Do you still take odd jobs every once in a while? I mean, I'm sure there's all kinds of random things to do in Kansas from, you know, around the agriculture industry. Do you ever just take little things like that still just to make a little bit on the side? Not, not really from a monetary standpoint. And because I, I live sort of a rural um, lifestyle out here, I, I pitch in every once in a while when, when people need work done, um, you know, from, uh, on my parents' land to my, my sister's land to, to neighbors, but not really as a way to make ends meet because, uh, again, I'm, I'm lucky enough or I put my time in enough that I can go do teaching gigs or public speaking gigs, uh, or, or even writing gigs that just pay more than $10 an hour or whatever it would take 
take to do that. I, I'm certainly not opposed to it, but just it, it's in that I'm in that situation where if my time is going to be applied to something in terms of making money to travel, I'm in a position where I can I can do some more high profile stuff that that's that's simply going to pay off in a more efficient way than helping my neighbor fix his fence for money, you know. And and, and I've sort of been gra- a grandfathered in. I just spoke at TravelCon down in Austin. It was the the first year that it that's happened. It was a really great travel conference that's going to become annual. The organizer, Matt Kepnes, Nomadic Matt, asked me to do a keynote, and I realized that this year is the 20th anniversary of me being a full-time travel writer, so the talk became 20. I'm, I'm sort of this silverback. like the, I'm this old-timer now in the travel writing world, um, and I, I can benefit from that a little bit, and so I don't know. I, I'm sure that there's an equivalent. S- somebody in the year 2038 is going to look back on 20 years, and they're going to have their own toolkit of how they make a, a living, and that might include public speaking and teaching and freelance writing, but but it might not. And in fact, that's what I told people at the conference, that the way we tell tell travel stories 10 years from now will probably involve technology or platforms that haven't been invented yet. So it's just good to be good to be fluid and, and just keep focused on your passion uh, rather than trying to guess what the next hustle will be. That's good advice. Just kind of fitting that passion into whatever the medium's going to be. Yeah, because there's just no way to predict it at this point. And so in saying that, what's on the horizon for Rolf Pods? What do you got going on and what, do you, what kind of new things are you going to be trying in the future? Well, for, for once, you've caught me at this moment where I'm not quite sure yet. Um, and, and like I said, I have a wall full of sticky notes here. And so I have a lot of possibilities. I, I usually go someplace warm in the winter. Of course, I'm often in Europe in the summer. So I think I'm going to go back to Asia this this year. Whether or not that is tied to a specific writing project depends on some things. I've been doing some screenwriting projects. Of course, I've been doing my podcast. Uh, and so... Um, to be honest, I'm not really sure yet, um, but I do know that it will involve travel. I do know that it will involve writing, uh, and I certainly hope it'll involve learning, learning new lessons and in, enhancing my life in surprising ways. But to say I'm going to be doing X in the next six months, I actually um, have no idea, which is kind of exciting, kind of exciting, but kind of unsettling. So that's one of the things while I'm home here in Kansas. For the next few weeks, it's something that I'll be sort of considering – and it's a blessing, really, to be able to to decide how I'm going to spend my time out of uh, out of a pool of choices. But I need to pick one, uh, and of course, it needs to be able to make me some money. It needs to be something that I enjoy. But I have no idea. Um, but uh, next spring, for sure, I'll be uh, I'll be busy doing it. I just don't know what it is yet. Awesome, man. No, that's that is a cool place to be in. You know, it's a it's a fortunate place to be in. Definitely. And so, uh, is it, you you released a book this year earlier this year? Is that correct? I did. Yeah, I, I released a book uh, called Souvenir, uh, which is a short book, which is part of Bloomsbury's uh, Object Lessons series. Uh, and each book in the series sort of looks into a, a sort of a personal and cultural history of different objects. I mean, there's a book about socks, and there's a book about uh, portable radios, and there's a book about rust. And um, as a travel guy, I've been interacting with and taking notes on souvenirs forever. And in fact, I started collecting souvenirs when I was a little kid. I think it's just sort of a natural thing that we do. So I explored that sort of psychologically, but also culturally and anthropologically and memoiristically. And it's a short book. It's 120 books, but it's sort of, I'm sorry, 120 pages, but it sort of walks the reader through this process of the souvenir experience in a way that's sort of surprising. I've talked to a lot of people who said, Oh, I didn't think that that there was much to say about souvenirs, but actually it really is this deep form of storytelling. And oftentimes the only audience is ourself, that we're sort of we're narrating our own lives by these objects we collect in our travels. And and sometimes the meaning of those objects changes over time. And I'm sitting in my office at home and I'm I'm surrounded by these objects that I've used to to tell the story of my life and to remind myself of my travels. So this, the book, and it's just literally called Souvenir by Rolf Potts. It's it's a deep dive uh, into this process, um, and it's just another fun little corner of the travel experience that I was able to explore at book length. That's awesome, man. No, that's that's I, I haven't read it yet, but I'd love to. I'll give it a read because that's uh, that's got to be fascinating. You had to have come across some interesting thoughts in that about why we collect things and why we feel that impulse. I mean, we were just in, uh, 
the Seattle area this weekend at Olympic National Park, and I just felt the so strongly to pick up a piece of driftwood and take it with me. I'm just like, I've got to take this, and I didn't know why, but it, it was uh, it's funny. I just went through that. Yeah, that's an impulse that goes back to childhood. And man, Olympic National Park, I love that place. Uh, were you on the coast or were you inland? Uh, both. So uh, on the side, I do a, a backpacking company where I basically not teach people how to vagabond, but we teach, we basically outfit people to go backpacking for trips, uh, usually people that have never tried it before, people that would normally stay in a hotel or, you know, somewhere, um, an Airbnb. We get them in the backcountry. And, uh, and so I was researching a new route for that. And uh, so we went inland. We're looking at a route that goes from around Hurricane Ridge, way up on one there. Of the ridges, yep, and goes down to the sea. And so you camp at the ridge, you camp in between, and then you camp on the ocean. And instead of staying in a hotel, you get to stay in the backcountry for four days. And that is that is a gorgeous, gorgeous national park. Oh, I mean, that oh. is just amazing. And it is so underrated. I, I it was, there was hardly anyone there over the weekend, and it was pretty decent weather. And I just, when I listen, I, I love national parks and we go all the time, um, to parks all over. But when I listen to like, uh, talks about some of the best parks, that one is never on anyone's radar. And to me, oh. it, it's probably my second favorite behind Yosemite and it's unprecedented, man. Yeah. It, it blew my mind. The first time I went, I was, I was 17 in high school looking for places to go to college and I was at Ruby beach. I watched the sun go down yeah. at Ruby beach and, yep. and it was so beautiful. I, you know, I almost cried. And then when I was uh, living in the Pacific Northwest, I would go do solo trips. I would hike I did the whole river. If that's how it's pronounced. I think I hiked up to, to the glaciers. And so I, that place is close to my heart. And that's, that's, the, that's the thing about American national parks. There's so many of them. Uh, and so many of them are just these, these secrets. I mean, it's like, like I was saying, these cities, there's so many cool hip places to live, but there's these places we haven't heard of that are also great. And it's the same with national parks that I don't know why Olympic national park isn't on the tip of everybody's tongue because it's such an amazing place. I totally agree. It's so close to Seattle. I don't understand it, but yeah, I, you know, I was, we went up to hurricane Ridge for sunset the the day it was really sunny and Holy cow, I, I got emotional. I just can't handle how beautiful all that is, you know? So yeah, and, and there's 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 towns right outside so many of these parks that people just don't think about, and they're really close to metro areas. And I, I, I we were looking at the town of Port Angeles that it's right mm. at the base, and I'm like, why is this place not totally just exploded? It seems so ripe for a bunch of hipsters to move in. <laughs> it, yeah, well, one answer, I think it's a temperate rainforest up there, so I think some people might get tired of the weather, but I think I think Raymond Carver lived in Port Angeles, and of course, the Twilight series is set in Forks, I think, and Kurt, Kurt Cobain grew up around there, and so there's all these... Well, there's all these cultural associations with the area, but I, you know, I guess it's it's more solitude for people like you and me who know how amazing that place is. But um, and it's you know it's it's I don't know, it might, I don't know if it's the only temperate rainforest. I saw clovers as big as my hand, and I don't have small hands in in that rainforest. Uh, and so yeah, it, again, it's there probably is a hipster scene. There probably are people living there right now who just can't believe how good their luck is that they're living in Port Angeles or, or one of these other places. Um, but you know, there's a place, you know, there's people living near big bend and, and near parks in, in new England and other parts of, of the country who are also can't believe their luck. And so it goes back to one of my vagabonding principles. Don't set limits, don't set limits to, to what's beautiful and amazing. And, and even if you haven't heard of it and it's not making top 10 lists that there's just no shortage of amazing places in, in the U S and, and worldwide. Man, thank you so much. I, I actually got one more question to you. It's a set of questions, and then uh, we'll wrap up. Something I like to ask people with this Life Outside the Box series is, in, in your pursuit to turn your passion into a career, what has been something for you that has been surprisingly easy and another thing that's been surprisingly hard? I think just the basic the basic 2 plus 2 equals 4 of long-term travel has been the easy part. Um, that there's been very few stages in my travel career where it isn't just a lot simpler than I thought. You know, I went around the world with no luggage and, and a cameraman to, to sort of prove this point about travel minimalism. And one problem in telling the, the story from the road was how easy it 
was after one week. Like I, I sort of got used to having no bags and keeping an extra pair of socks and underwear in, in, in my pockets. And pretty soon the narrative wasn't about the challenge of no baggage because th that wasn't a challenge anymore. The narrative just sort of became about the places I was traveling in. And that's sort of an echo of, of everything that happened before is that everywhere I've gone after a, a week or two, I just get used to it. And, and humans are adaptable. And if you're, if you're open to the sorts of simple challenges uh, that are presented by travel. It's just simple problem solving. Um, then, so that was the easy part is that just travel has always been easier and cheaper and safer than I assumed it would be. And then the more difficult part, um, I guess it's just, the, just the ongoing change of making a life of it is that you can't, I, I just can't settle into one way of being, I, you know, it's, it's, it's an outside of the box, uh, lifestyle, uh, that my community, I'm close to my family, but I don't really have a home community necessarily that I see all the time. The technologies and opportunities of the travel writing world keep changing. And so it keeps, it keeps me on my toes. You know, I, I, I can't get complacent and that's, I guess that's a good way to be, but at the same time, there's always a little bit of hustle involved lifestyle wise, just as far as maintaining my sense of community and then, then, um, you know, making a living amid all the changes of this world. Yeah. Well, I guess that's a better alternative than becoming really complacent and having to fight against that. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure there's an overweight, depressed, uh, couch-sitting version of myself that that uh, <laughs> that, I, that I don't need to communicate. That's funny. Well, man, I, I really appreciate you being on here. Um, I was, you were definitely on my short list of people I wanted to get in contact with as soon as I started hosting this show. So uh, thanks again for making this happen and taking the time. Yeah, you bet. And, 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 and good luck in the ongoing journey. Hey, thanks for listening, y'all. If you have any comments on the show or if you want to see a certain guest on here, give us a call at 812-MAIL-POD. Mail as in voicemail. So again, that's 812-MAIL-POD. Looking forward to hearing from you.